Our first speaker right now is going to be Russ Paldrick. He's professor in the Stanford Department of Psychology. His lab's research uses neuroimaging to understand how neural systems give rise to complex cognitive functions and how these systems break down in neuropsychiatric disorders. They're also heavily involved in the development of neuroinformatics tools, including ontologies of mental function through the Cognitive Atlas Project, data sharing through the Open fMRI and NeuroVault projects, and automated metadata analysis through the NeuroSynth Project. So please welcome Russ Baldrick. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I think my talk is going to follow really well over uh, after the last two. Um, I'm going to talk about a slightly different type of neuroimaging from what uh, Brian talked about. Brian's work focuses on imaging brain structure. Ours focuses primarily on imaging brain function. And so we use a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. The way this works is you think about something. Let's say I'm trying to decide whether to eat a muffin or a banana at the snack table out there. When I do that, neurons in my brain fire. And um, that's how I compute that decision in my head. And um, it turns out that when neurons in your brain fire, there are associated changes in blood flow and blood oxygenation in the area right near where those neurons are, within a couple millimeters of there. And it turns out that we can sensitize magnetic resonance imaging to that. And that's how I'm sure you've seen pictures like this with blobs on them in news stories about where love is in the brain or why, you know, why we love our iPhones. Um, and that's how we generate those images, by being sensitized to those changes in neural activity that we can see in blood flow. Um, it's, this is by far the most popular technique for studying human brain function. It's safe, non-invasive. We just basically put somebody in an MRI scanner, have them do things. We don't have to inject them with anything or expose them to any ionizing radiation. Um, as of uh, sorry, April 2015, um, there are over 40,000 papers that mention fMRI in their um, abstract in PubMed. And if you want to kind of guesstimate how much data are actually out there, let, I just guesstimated that this is probably, a, I try to be conservative, let's say half of them are actually reporting empirical data sets. And if we assume, say, a, you know, a, a subject, a population size of 16 people, and uh, which is pretty small for uh, today's standards, assume that they had to spend $300 for an hour of scan time. That's sort of a low estimate. Um, that's over 340, 334,000 people who've participated in those studies, over $100 million just in data acquisition costs. That's not even counting the personnel time to do the stuff, and um, over 10 petabytes of data. Now, you know, we, we heard earlier about sort of, you know, have, it, one person's big data is another person's small data, right? So our big data is kind of like small big data, I think. Um, you know, a single one of those 10-minute brain imaging scans generates about 600 megabytes of data. Standard study would have from 50 to 100 gigabytes of raw data and up to, you know, at least half a terabyte often of, uh, of process data once we do all of our complex uh, analyses on it. Um, Brian mentioned the Human Connectome Project. I, I take one criterion for big data as being so big that you have to mail hard drives. And the Human Connectome Project, basically, if you want some of the data, you can get them online. If you want the full data set, you have to order this connectome in a box where they send you four, four terabyte hard drives. Um, and if you wanted to process these data in serial, even just doing kind of a simple processing stream, um, it would take you, you know, well over a year to do that, and that's why we generally use high-performance computing resources to actually process the data. So um, this is a, a figure from a paper that, that Chris and I published last year in Nature Neuroscience, which sort of highlights um, and sort of gets back to some of the comments that Steve made about, you know, what, what is shared, right? So what I want to do today is walk through the different types of things that can and are being shared in neuroimaging. Um, and starting with kind of the easiest things to share, which are actually things that are already published in the papers, um, down to things that are really hard to share, like that connectome in a box. So I'm going to first focus on sort of taking things that are already in the papers and looking at how well we can actually use them. Um, and so it turns out that in our literature, when you report data, you generally report, uh, so let's say I, you know, I do my study, I find several blobs of activity in the brain. What I'll do is I'll make a table like this that... Um, uh, I don't have my mouse. Um, a table like this that basically has XYZ coordinates that reflect this relatively standardized stereotactic space. So with those three numbers, I can tell basically where I am in the brain. We take all the different individuals' brains and kind of warp them into this common space so we know roughly where we are. Um, and now we can take those, uh, those data, and you know, we've gone from 
say about 200,000 little what we call voxels, the you know the, the three-dimensional pixels in the brain, and we've now crunched that down to you know what on the order of say 50 numbers. Um, so we've you know heavily sparsified the data. Um, nonetheless, the question is whether we can do something with this heavily sparsified data. So. Um, initially, there was a project called Brain Map that did this by hand. They would take the papers, have minions sit down and kind of punch in those XYZ coordinates. Um, a few years ago, Tal Yarconi, who's now at University of Texas, came up with a method for automatically extracting those things from papers. So any journal that publishes papers in HTML format, his tool can basically suck the tables out. Um, and what that does is it lets you get lots of papers in. Obviously, it's going to be junkier than having it be done by hand, but you know, whereas the brain map data set now is on the order of 2,500 papers, we in you know, four years have gone now up over 10,000 papers. Um, and when we compare it to manually curated data from another database, it has pretty good sensitivity and specificity. So the idea of what we do is we take those three-dimensional coordinates and wherever one of those was, we place a little sphere in the brain, right? So this is our um, kind of reconstituted brain map um, where we've taken each of those three-dimensional coordinates and placed a little blob there. So the idea is we've tried to reconstitute the original data from this highly sparsified data that were in the table. And then we can do meta-analysis of that. So neurosynth.org is a website that basically provides access to this. All the data are, you know, from those 10,000 papers are openly available, um, and, um, and as is the code to run all of this. Um, and so the idea is if you want to know what are the brain areas that have been associated with the concept of working memory, you go, you punch in working memory, and what this shows you is the places in the brain, the voxels in the brain that, in this case, are predictive of the term working memory showing up in the abstract of the paper. So we have a lexicon, an ontology of terms that are relevant to, uh, to cognitive function, and we take the fact that something is mentioned as kind of being indica indicative that that's what the paper is about. Um, and so um, we can see that there's you know, highly reliable associations between brain you know, activity and certain things being mentioned in papers. And if you go here, you can you know, download that image for further processing and so on. We can also ask, you know, what else can we do with this? And one of the things we've looked at is, can we classify whether a particular thing is going to be mentioned in a paper? Can we predict what terms are going to be mentioned in a paper based on um, what the brain activity that's reported in those tables looks like? So, for example, if I want to know, you know, I have a, a, a brain map, and I want to know, um, is this from a study of pain or a study of emotion or a study of working memory, how well can I classify that uh, using these meta-analytic data? Um, and so we can do just a simple naive Bayes classifier, and it turns out we can classify really well. So in the top left, um, this is um, classification of new studies. So we take a paper that we've never seen before, and we ask how well can we classify whether it's going to include the term working memory or pain or emotion, and we can actually classify quite well. Um, we can push that further and say, let's take data from an individual subject. This is a very different kind of data, right? This is a whole brain map, not just a, one of those meta-analytic maps. And we ask, can we classify each subject and tell you, was that person doing something related to emotion or pain or working memory? And it turns out that we can fairly accurately do that as well. Um, we can push this further and ask amongst a bunch of different terms, how well can we classify just between pairs of terms? So I want to know, you know, is this a paper about uh, reward versus pain? How well can I classify those two things just using the coordinates that were published in the paper? And the point of this is that most of this is green-ish, um, and greenish is fairly reasonable classification accuracy in the 70 to 80 percent range. There's a few things we can't classify, which turn out to be, we think, really interesting because they tell us something about, you know, either about the way those terms are being used or about sort of the way in which the processes that people think are different might not actually be different. And that relates back to the, the work we're doing on ontologies that I don't have time to get into today. We can also ask whether we can sort of extract higher order knowledge out of this kind of you know, simple association between terms and activation locations. And so one of the things we've done is used an approach uh, called topic modeling um, that basically s assumes that papers are about latent topics. When you go to write a paper, you have some kind of ideas in your mind that we think of as topics, and those generate the words that end up in the paper. 
So using techniques like the one we use is called latent Dirichlet allocation, you can sort of infer, given a set of documents where you know the act activation locations, you know the, the terms, um, we can infer, you know, what are the topics that are kind of being talked about in those papers. So for every paper, let's say, you know, we find 100 topics, we have a loading for every paper on every topic. That's what these, these arrows refer to. Um, and then we can ask further, what brain systems are associated with each of the topics? So here's just an example from a paper we published a couple years ago, um, where on top you see we did a, a topic model um, looking at terms related to mental processes. So the, um, the terms that are listed there, memory, episodic memory, recall, learning, verbal memory, those are the top terms that are associated with that topic. Suggesting that this is a topic that's about some aspect of memory that loads across, in this case, 389 of the papers that were in the analysis. And then above that, you see a brain map that shows the, the parts of the brain that were related to that particular topic. When, that, when the words that are highly associated with that topic were talked about, those brain areas were active. And it turns out that that's a set of areas that we have known for a long time to be related to memory. Um, here's one on the bottom where you can do the same thing with uh, disease terms. So we put a bunch of, you know, we basically do the topic modeling using all the disease terms. One of the topics it gives us back is this one that highly loads on anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and so on. And that shows you, again, activity in an area that has long been associated with those, uh, with those topics. So the, the idea is that we can start to extract higher order generalities from this, you know, what, what you would probably think of as pretty junky data. Um, now, ultimately, we, you know, that's only going to get us so far because of the junkiness of the data. So it's going to be good for providing intuitions and getting a feel for what the, the literature looks like. And it's, you know, it doesn't require the investigators to do anything other than put that paper, paper, the table in their paper. But we can also ask kind of where can we go from there? Can we try to get people to actually share something beyond what they've written in the paper? So NeuroVault is a project that, that Chris uh, Gorilusi started to get people to share one of those intermediate things. So like in, in Steve's uh, figure, you had you know the very raw data at the top, and then you have kind of the, the reported stuff at the bottom. And in the middle is sort of the analyzed data, which for us is a statistical map. It's a three-dimensional data set where at every each one of those 200,000 or so spots in the brain, you tell me what is the statistic for that, you know, the response of the brain on whatever it is that you're measuring. So the idea behind NeuroVault is that we make it really easy for people to just upload a data set and share it quickly. So they, they log in, they create a new collection that could either be private or public, um, and then they upload some maps. And they can give us some metadata if they want. We've actually taken the view that we'd, we'd rather get data with relatively little metadata than not get any data at all. Um, and so we don't require people to put in very much. We, uh, we allow them to put in more if they can. Um, and then we also uh, potentially try to take advantage of uh, crowdsourcing sites to that, such that you know, somebody else could come back and add more metadata later. The one thing that we really need to know is you know, what's the DOI for the paper because um, that's going to be our ultimate kind of source for the, you know, the, the details about the data set that we might not get from the person. Once we do that, they, they upload their image, we can do a few things. Now we can give them a permalink so that, that they can put that in their paper and say, if you wanna actually go click around on these data, not just see that little table that we gave you, you can actually do that. You can download the data from there. Um, you can visualize the data on the website if you just wanna kind of poke around and see what the data look like. Um, and then you can um, decode the data. So let's say it's from a study where you're not quite sure what kind of strategy people are using. Um, you can use all of the data from the Neurosynth project that I just mentioned. And what we can do is basically say, you know, for for, for this particular image, what are the most similar images in the Neurosynth database? So in this case, it might be speech perception, language, and so on. And what we found is that doing meta-analysis with these kind of data um, provides us uh, sort of insights that we couldn't have gotten doing meta-analysis from the, um, the Neurosynth data set. So the top one shows you just the average activity across all of the 10,000 or so maps in the Neurosynth database. And what that's telling you is basically there's some hot spots there. Those are areas that are active in lots of imaging studies, probably in a quarter of all imaging studies, these uh, anterior cingulate and anterior insular regions get activated. And that's probably because most studies are having people do difficult things, and those are parts of the brain that turn on when people do difficult things. 
Um, if we look at the unthresholded maps that are uploaded into the NeuroVault website, so now we've gone from taking those little blobs and making our, you know, redoing the images out of them to getting the actual images back. Now it turns out we can actually see some things that weren't evident there. We see, you know, the same spots are turning on, like, you know, those, the ones you saw at the top, but you see some blue areas there. It turns out those blue areas are areas that always turn down their activity whenever somebody does something difficult. They actually turn up when you're just kind of sitting and daydreaming. We call them the default mode network. Um, and now that we're looking at unthreshold maps, we can actually start to pull that out, whereas we couldn't from the other data. Okay, so now let's step to the hardest part of data sharing, which is sharing of full raw data sets. And I'm gonna focus on, um, on a particular project that we've uh, done called the Open fMRI Project. Now, um, if you ask kind of how much in total of all of that, you know, the 10 petabytes of data has been shared, um, get, the guesstimate is about 1% probably, certainly not much more than 1%. So there's, you know, all sorts of kind of, you know, dark data out in the world. Um, a lot of it is just irretrievable. I've gone back and now and tried to get people who've done kind of famous early imaging studies to pull out the data and give it to me. And usually the answer is something like, well, it's on a tape that we don't have a reader for anymore or something like that. So there's a lot of data that are, that are just missing, a lot that's just sitting on a hard drive somewhere uh, unavailable to us. It turns out that our field had a bit of a false start with, uh, with data sharing um, back around 2000. A project was started at Dartmouth called the fMRI Data Center by a, a very eminent figure in cognitive neuroscience and also sort of a galvanizing figure. Um, uh, and it, basically what they did was they, um, they built this center to sort of house, you know, the share, uh, house shared raw fMRI data sets. And they um, convinced a couple of journals to actually require submission of data sets upon publication, one being PNAS, the other being Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, and this led to a huge firestorm. Basically, the field was just not ready socially for, for data sharing. And so um, Nature, Nature Neuroscience had editorials. There was an open letter. This is the bottom is text from this open letter um, from a, a number of kind of prominent cognitive neuroscientists who basically said, we are particularly concerned with any journal's decision to require all authors of all fMRI-related papers accepted for publication to submit all experimental data pertaining to their paper to the data center. So really big uh, um, firestorm around this. fMRI data center, uh, ended up basically dying. The data, I think, still exists somewhere, but the, actually they seem to have even lost the, the URL, fmridc.org now. Um, so 2009, um, basically the, the birth of open fMRI was when I moved from UCLA to Texas, and I had a bunch of data that I needed to anonymize in order to move them over to my new servers and um, decided that if I'm anonymizing them and you know, we had for many years instituted a relatively strict kind of data organization structure in the lab, so they're all organized the same way, we decided to share them online. So we initially put up eight data sets. Um, and I had selfish reasons, because I'm really interested in looking at how brain systems span across lots of different cognitive tasks. And, you know, I figured I could get a lot more data if I actually get people from other places to also give, you know, give me their data. Um, and so it was, you know, it's, I, I can tell you a story about how I do it because I'm, I'm an altruist, but really it was selfish. Um, but so openfmri.org was started with a few principles. One of the principles is completely open data sharing. So we actually, you know, many, many sites, you have to agree to publication policies and agree to all sorts of other, you know, data use restrictions. Um, we made the decision we want to make the, the reuse as easy as possible. So we actually distribute the data via a public domain dedication, which means you can take the data and do anything you want with them. Um, they're anonymized. Um, so, uh, you know, there are questions about sort of the ability to re-identify that we were talking about during the break. Um, but in general, without having an, an image of the person's brain already, it would be basically impossible to re-identify them. Um, we Put, we, we share the data via a very consistent scheme of organization but for both data and metadata that allows reanalysis in a, in a pretty straightforward way. And we actually have pipelines that are available so, so, so somebody could actually take those data and sort of, you know, go process them on their own cluster pretty quickly. 
the, the, the downside of this is it requires a really substantial amount of curation. Um, and so our throughput has been relatively low in terms of the number of data sets we can get in. Right now we're at 33 data sets, a little over 800 subjects. Um, and some number of those data sets are actually not curated yet. So we've now started basically uh, distributing uncurated data sets with a uh, disclaimer, these are uncurated. Um, other than having made sure that they don't have identifying information, we, we haven't made sure that they follow our, um, our data organization standards such that they can actually be processed using the pipelines. Um, using these data though, we can do kinds of uh, analyses that we just couldn't do uh, with the other sorts of data. So this is uh, just one example, a paper that Sammy Koyajo, who's a, a research scientist in the lab did, where he basically took a bunch of data on about 300 people, and for each of the data sets, first we, um, we sort of characterized what are the psychological processes that we think are going on in the particular comparison that was done in that data set. So sometimes it might be a task that involves visual processing, sometimes auditory processing, sometimes decision making, and so on. And then the question is, okay, if we train a classifier to kind of classify data based on, you know, whether the person's engaging in vision or auditory processing or decision making, now given data from a new person, can we classify which of those processes amongst you know, all of these 20-something um, alternatives are being turned on. Um, and his work has shown that at least for some of those processes we can do so. One of the big limitations is we just don't have enough tasks that are tapping into the, each of these individual ones to be able to really push this out. And that's really the impetus for trying to grow the database more. So I will finish up by just mentioning a new center that we're starting with funding from the Lauren John Arnold Foundation called the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience. And the idea here is going to be to really sort of take open fMRI to the next level and use it to push people to analyze their data in a different way. To think about, you know, in, in our field, all the analyses are based on, you know, statistic, null hypothesis, statistical testing at every one of those spots in the brain. And so, you know, you publish a paper when you have a result that is statistically significant. Um, we want to push people to think more about uh, reproducibility in, um, in the analysis of their data, both reproducibility across data sets, say across subsets of a large data set or across different data sets, and reproducibility across analysis streams. We have incredible amounts of analytic flexibility here. There's a, a recent paper, took one data set from OpenFMRI and ran it through more than 6,000 different uh, analysis workflows and show that you get some, you know, substantial differences in the results across those. We want to make it easy for people to run a data set, you know, using high performance computing, run it through those 6,000 workflows, but now not say, let's find the best one and put it in the paper. Let's say, how robust is our result to, um, to all those different workflows? Um, and so this is work that, that we're, uh, we're just starting in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Brian Wandel's group. Um, so I hope I've given you a, a flavor for kind of the ecosystem that's evolving. You know, I think that, you know, even though we've only shared 1% of our data, we actually, you know, the open science is doing fairly well, and at least the next generation of neuroimaging researchers seem very attuned to, um, to wanting to both share code and share data, and so we're hopeful that, uh, that this will continue to grow. And finally, I just want to thank my lab uh, and others who've worked on this. Thank you. Yep, Mike. Uh, two questions. <laughs> two questions. Uh, the first, what can we learn about the experience of the neuroscience uh, uh, community with regard to the rejection of the Dartmouth effort? What is it that we need to know as we think about uh, what we're trying to do now, 15 years later? I think the main lesson is that requiring sharing without a really broad agreement amongst the amongst all the the researchers in the field is uh, is a bad idea. That's the that's the thing that that really pissed people off. Okay. And the second qu question is uh, slightly clinical. In the October issue of Brain magazine, Hugh Defoe and some other um, neurosurgeons published an article on the basis of several hundred operations they had done on brains, people with living, living brains, people mm -hmm. <laughs> survived right. that. Um, they posit a, uh, some brain mapping. How well does that conform to what you're finding with your work? Do you know? 
Um, I haven't directly compared those, so I don't. I don't actually know. I'll, I, I wonder if their data are available. It would be interesting yeah, to, to a, do really direct comparisons. Yeah, it was the lead. It was the free article in Brain and um, huh, okay. or the lead article in Brain in October. I hadn't October seen that. 14th. I'll have to go back and look at it and see if we Please might do it, then let's see talk. if we can. Yeah, great. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much.